one is going to abide with you forever. Let us read uh, John, John chapter 14, verse 16. So as we just give this introduction, John 14, verse 16. And he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. The King James will say another comforter to, uh, to be with you forever. So are you understanding that? Another helper to be with you forever. Why is he saying another helper? And now that's the first thing that we will note. He's saying another helper. So that means there is already an helper on ground and there have been helpers that have come before now. But he said, this one will abide with you forever. So the Holy Spirit that, we, that has been given unto us by reason of the new birth and, okay, I'll just leave it there, by reason of the new birth has come to abide with us forever. That is your personal operating system. An operating system, an OS, as we call it, is the engine that defines and drives a machine or a system. And that Holy Spirit that has been given to you is what is able, is what will transform you completely and will continue to keep you updated. Just as operating systems are updated, Android will, operate their, will update their system, Apple will, uh, will update their system, right? The Holy Spirit in you is not just, okay, I just have that uh, friend and, you know, that guides me through life, but he keeps you updated regarding things that have to do with the mind of God. He keeps you updated. So when you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you are in line with the agenda of God for the, for the time being. And you, it will be very hard for you to get, to get stuck to, to get stuck in a mode or to get stuck, for example, to get stuck in religion or to get stuck in anything. No, you are updated on what God is doing at every time. So that's why Jesus said that he would teach you. He would take what is of me and he would teach it to you. So it is very powerful. Jesus said, I'm going to send you another helper. King James will say another comforter. And the truth about the matter is that man has always been in need of a comforter, of a helper that will abide with him forever. Ever since the fall of man, man has been in expectation of a helper. Has always been, and all the prophecies that transcend scripture from the inception of time, even unto the manifestation of Jesus Christ, has been man expecting a helper. And God, throughout time, had sent people, had sent men in to, to, to be a figure of the true help that he was going to send to mankind in Jesus Christ. So when man fell, God has sent types. When a man called Noah was born, a man called Noah was born, and a prophecy came at his birth that he said that this one is going to bring us comfort. He says he will, be, he will bring, give us comfort because of the ground that the Lord has caused. Genesis chapter 5, verse 29. And he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has caused. This one will comfort us. Concerning our work. So, pretty much because the judgment of God was released upon the earth. The judgment of God was on the earth. Because, remember, the Lord uh, caused the ground. Why? Because of, because of sin. So, because of sin, the ground was caused. And a man, Noah, called Noah, was born. And a prophecy came that he will comfort. He will bring comfort because of this judgment. And Noah indeed came as a figure of that comfort. The Bible called him a preacher of righteousness. He came as a figure of that comfort. And he did things, but he was not that true comforter. And men have come throughout time 
Israel came to the time of, of their kings and they couldn't bring that comfort. They came to the time of their, of their judges. Different judges came in Israel, Samson, many of them. And each time those judges were alive, if the nation had help. But each time the judges die, the nation would go into captivity. And the, that has been the, the manner until Jesus came on the scene. Who is that Christ? So that was why when he was going, the disciples questioned him. He said, you are about to go, but the scripture says that Christ will abide forever. How come you are saying that you are about to die? To, because they didn't understand it. They said the scripture says that Christ will abide forever. So what if, now can the scripture lie? If the scripture has said that Christ will abide forever. So what does that mean? So, but Jesus died. <laughs> Sorry? Glory to God. He came back. So when we now we are talking about the Holy Spirit, in fact, rather, let me say he resurrected. He's alive. And he came back to us. But we have him dwelling in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So we have, there is no, I know it sounds very interesting, but there's no difference with what the disciples having Christ with them. In fact, they were limited in a way. Having Christ with them before his resurrection they were limited because he, in the human body, before his resurrection, had some, some, some limitations in terms of his power. He had limitations. But now, him in the presence of the Holy Spirit in us gives us limitless possibilities in Christ. Limitless possibilities in life, in coming into the life and power of Jesus Christ. So this is very important. So that's why you see Jesus in that John chapter 14 that we, that we just read. John chapter 14, he says, he says um, uh, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. The King James will say, are many mansions. If it were not so, would have would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. That where I am, you may be also. So, the indwelling spirit brings us daily to the fullness of Christ. Brings us daily to the fullness of Christ. Now, let me explain something in this, in this uh, scripture. The verse 2, where it says, In my father's house are many rooms. It would interest you to know that the word man used for mansion or for rooms there, it simply means abode. There are many dwelling places. In fact, if you look at John 14, verse 23, that same John, and if you go to verse 23, it depends on you know, the Bible translation that you'll you, you, you be using. The, the ESV will say home. But verse 23, where it says, um, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. The King James will say, make our abode. The word used for mansion in verse 2 is exactly the same word used for abode or for home here. So he's saying that in my father's house, there are many dwelling places so and then he says that uh, in verse 3 that and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again and will take you to myself that where i am ye may be also so when he says in my father's house he says in the house of the father in, in, the, in the father's house, you know, we can just try to draw a, a, a house here. Yeah. So, this is the door, one door, which is Christ. It says, in my father's house, there are many rooms. Let us say this all represent rooms. And remember, okay, we can clean this outline now. We have seen the outline, so we can clean parts of it. So, these are all rooms in the Father's house. So, Jesus said, in my Father's house, there are many 
rooms. We've seen that the word for mansions there is, means dwelling places. There are many dwelling places in my father's house. There are many dwelling places. So Jesus said, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would, have, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? So he said he was going to prepare a room for us in this place. Now, what is Jesus referring to? Where is this father's house? Heaven, okay? So the father's house is heaven. The father's house is man. Okay. And when we talk about, I will now add, I will say number one, the father's house is man in first principle. That means you and I as individuals. And then second principle, the father's house also <clears throat> is the church. So when we come together like this, we are the father's house. But the father's house is man. So it says, in my father's house are many mansions. Let us also read Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. But uh, Christ as over, but Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house are what? We. So we are the house of God. So when he says whose house are we, he's talking about number one, as individuals and corporately. So we are the house of God. So that means that father's house is us. Now he says, in my father's house are many rooms. That father's house, in fact, for starters, for starters, for starters, that father's house is Christ, is Christ, and then is us. <laughs> Does that make sense? Jesus says that if any man loves me and keeps my commandment, that me and the father will come and make our dwelling with him. And then he says, abide in me and I. In you. So when you abide in him, he is the, the house. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that the builder and maker of all things is God. His builder and maker of all things is God. Now, so abide in him who is the house, he abides in you, and you also become the house of God. You also become the house of God. So he says, so it's a two way thing. He says, I and the Father will come and abide in you and make our abode in you. So, so we are in Christ. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, right? If any man is in Christ, so that means for you to be in Christ, that means Christ is a house. The Bible says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. And then it will now say, so it says, if any man be in Christ, a new creature, and then in another place, it will say, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So you in Christ and Christ in you. So he is the father's house. But as we, these mansions are in, are in him. So how did he go to prepare a place? He went to prepare a place by his death. So when he says, I go to prepare a place for you, that's where I am, you may be also. Let us read it, John chapter 14, verse 3. It says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will do what? Take you to myself. <laughs> it was only by his death and resurrection that he could take man to himself. That where I am, you may also be. And you know the way to where I am going. Of course, Thomas Challenge that he said we don't we don't know the way and <laughs> other conversations we had, but he says that I may come. Okay, uh, it's saying that I will come again and receive you to myself. But then, won't the rapture make sense? Won't the rapture make sense? Okay, how do you mean? Like because isn't the rapture just you directly being teleported? <laughs> be teleported. Yeah. I mean, the way it sounds, it, 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 it sounds like something like that. Mm -hmm. But so you are saying that 
Okay, so now it's how we understand when he says, I may come again and receive you unto myself. So because note, he says, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may also be. Okay, so are you where Christ is? Let, open your Bible to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. By the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Christ's death is your death. In fact, if you have not been raised up with him, you are not saved. Okay, so by okay. raised up, do you mean baptism of the Holy Spirit? No, not necessarily. By raised up with him for all mankind, Jesus, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ was for all of us, was for all of mankind. Remember, it took one man, the death of one man to affect all of us. So Jesus came in the figure of that one man. So that is why the Bible calls him the last Adam. The Bible calls him the last Adam. So Jesus came the figure of that, of, that, of that one man and died for us. So just as the death of Adam affected all of us, the death of Christ also, he took, the Adam's death was our death and death is a judgment for what? Sin. It's a judgment for sin. So the judgment of God was on mankind, but Jesus came and took that judgment in his death and in that his death, he took our death and died and raised up. So I was risen up. So as Adam's death meant our death, the resurrection of Christ was you, was your resurrection and my resurrection. Now, after the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus ascended up to heaven. Jesus ascended to heaven. And the Bible now says that we too are ascended to heaven with him. Now, what does that mean? Let us now understand the concept of walking, walking, in, the experience, walking in the experience of salvation. Let us understand this. This is very important. The concept of walking in the experience of salvation. Everything that Jesus has done for us, the, he has completed the work. The work has been, it is not an unfinished work on his time, from his standpoint. It's not unfinished. So, it is finished. <laughs> it is finished. That was what Jesus said on the cross. That was the last thing he said. It is finished. So that means, what is, if the work of Christ has been finished in you from his standpoint, that means to him, that heaven that you are talking about, he, you, are, you are there. You are, you are already there by... Now, heaven, for starters, heaven is both... Heaven in the spirit. Heaven in the spirit. First of all, is heaven sp spiritual or physical? Spiritual. Right? Is it? No, I want to... Do you think it's spiritual? Okay, heaven is definitely spiritual. Even if heaven is a place, a location, a spiritual location, it's spiritual. It's not... It's not it. It's not. It's not physical. But then in Genesis, it says that the heavens opened up and earth filled with flood. That the heavens opened up and what? The earth was filled with water for for the flood. Oh no 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 no! That is the physical heaven. Yes. It means for that one, it means the sky. The sky. What well, when you look up, you see the sky and the stars. That is called heaven. That is physical. Okay. Remember when we talked about love? Love not the world. The world, that is part of the world. Okay. If you take a plane and fly high, you go to heaven. When man goes to space, that is heaven. Okay. So it simply means, when it says in that scripture, it means the sky opened up mm -hmm. and rain fell. Okay. Yeah. But heaven itself, if you are talking about the dwelling place of God. Mm -hmm. Now, the dwelling place of God, which will come there. Because we've already said that the dwelling place of God is man. But then... When, there's a reason why he also says heaven is my throne. And this begins to answer your question when you talk about what heaven is. Because if he says that you are his dwelling place and heaven is his throne, that means heaven must be in your heart. But however, let us not confuse ourselves with that. Let's leave that first. Heaven is spiritual. So heaven is spirit. It's spiritual. But also, 
Heaven, when we talk about the new, the new birth and the work of Christ in our heart, heaven becomes an estate. It becomes a life, a lifestyle, a life. It becomes an estate. So that's why Ephesians 2 will say we are seated down together with Christ in heavenly places. When our life is uh, relates to things of the earth, man is usually limited to the things that his five physical senses can relate to. And we take that limitation to try to understand things of God. So we are always limited to the things that our five physical senses can relate to. Things that our eyes can relate to, can see. Things that our ears can hear, that we can feel. Senses of touch, you know, things that we can perceive. So man is always, is bound to that. But however, what the spirit does is that it activates our spiritual senses. That things of the spirit become real to us. So when you receive the salvation of Christ and you begin to walk with him, maybe you have an issue with anger. As you begin to walk with him and overcome the sinful nature of anger and begin to live just as Christ lived, that is a heavenly lifestyle. That is a heavenly estate. So though you are on the earth, you are not you are not operating, though your physical body is on the earth, in spirit, you are not on the earth. That is why I said, heaven is what? Spiritual. Heaven is spiritual and man is what? What is man? Who are you? You are spiritual. You, you are a spirit. Yeah. Okay, do you believe that you have a spirit? Yeah. We saw... In the book of Genesis, man was created a spirit, not a physical being. He created man. Man is actually man and woman. He created male and female, created he them and blessed them. The blessing was spiritual. When he said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That is why the Bible says we are blessed with all spiritual blessings. When the blessing, the injunction was given on man to be fruitful and multiply, it was not the physical Adam. You can check it in the book of Genesis. It was when they were created. Then later on, he now formed man, Adam, from the dust of the ground. So your physical body, you know, I, okay, let's verify that. Let's go there in the book of Genesis. There are two accounts. So, uh, so God created man in his own image. Mm -hmm. and, uh, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And what? Male. No, no, then 28. And what? Then and God, God blessed them. Blessed them. Mm -hmm. That blessing was spiritual. It, was, it happened in the spiritual realm. It was not things that have to do with physical. So that's why the scripture later on says we are blessed with all spiritual blessings. Where? In heavenly places. So that means the heavenly places, the spirit who, which was man, was dwelling in heavenly, heavenly places. The spirit which was man, and that is the true home of man, his foundations is in the holy mountain. The Lord has loved the gate of Zion. The true estate, dwelling place of man, is not here. We are, that is why when reference is to be made to this earth, the Bible just says we are sojourners. This is, a, this is just a place we are passing by. With our physical bodies, but you, your spirit dwells in the heavenly. Okay, now let us take this step by step. Let's take it step by step. You have seen that you were created by God, a spirit, right? From here, you've seen it. Okay, to confirm that you were created by God, a spirit, just go to Genesis chapter 2. Move to Genesis chapter 2 and then read. Um, Verse 7. Oh, you've already gone there. Read verse 7. You see? Okay, so have you seen where you were, your body was made? This, your nice hair and your lovely skin tone was made here. But you were made where? Heaven. In the heaven. In, you were made a spirit. In, you were made in the spirit. And you were made a spirit. That is why when you were made a second time, you were made a spirit. 
Vous pouvez voir les amis. Born again. When you were made a second time, when you were born again, it, they, it went back to the factory room, which is spirit. So you must know your origin. That's why when Jesus came, look, this sounds trivial, but knowing your origin, what you have known today is very powerful. Knowing your origin is a game changer. I said when Jesus came, he says, I know where I am coming from. Before he could talk about it, I know where I'm going. I know where I'm coming from. If you do not know where you are coming from, forget about where you are going. So this is the origin of everything. We need to know. That is why Paul would say, Oh foolish Galatians, how can you begin in the spirit? Let's read it. Galatians chapter is it three? Verse 3, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So, knowing where, where, where you are, your origin. So, your origin, number one, you are spirit. And when the blessings of God was bestowed upon you, it was done in spirit. That is why when man, even when man lost that estate and fell and all manner of things, at the new birth, that is when you become, became born again. Ble that, those blessings were reactivated in your spirit man. Um, because your spirit at, at the new birth became, came back in union with the spirit of God. And those blessings are impacted. And from your spirit man, that blessing affects every component of your being. To your mind, your desires, your emotion, your will, even to your body. So it affects everything. But how be it, your body is still on this earth. That is why the Bible says, crucify your members which are upon where? The earth. That's what the Bible says. Crucify your members, that is your body, your things that, your, your body which are upon the earth. Because as for your spirit, it's not there. Your spirit is back to the holy mountains. It's back to the holy mountains, which is God. So when he now talks about heaven, now, so now remember now, so if truly heaven is where God dwells, well, we will now see that heaven is not just limited to a place, there's a place somewhere in the spirit. Seeing that when we were born again, when we were born again in Christ, it is just as that creation story when we were made spirit and given those blessings. So seeing that, you now know that truly, when he says that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, that means you have been restored back to that estate. It's not, doesn't mean you are waiting, if you are waiting for a time, that you will go up and meet him somewhere heaven, in heaven. That is not ideal at all. Because that means that you have not even begun to walk in the realities of Christ. So we need to understand the reality of the realities of what Jesus has done for us. What Jesus, that as you became born again, you have been recreated back, restored to what he made you to be. And when he says be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. What does that mean for starters? Number one, to be fruitful and to, be multipl to multiply. When you think about the fact that that blessing was given where? in the heavenly realm, in spirit, not on the earth. So then now says be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So that means that that fruitful is spiritual. It's spiritually fruitful. As you begin to manifest the nature of Christ. And he says that will continue to increase. That's why then we will now begin to hear something called the fullness of Christ. It will continue to increase and do what? Replenish the earth. The first principle of that thing called the earth. The first principle of that thing called the earth is what? It's your body. And then even the earth, as you know, as you understand it to be. It's your body and then your surrounding. So when he says be fruitful, if you are spirit and he blesses you in spirit and says be fruitful and multiply and, and replenish the earth, that means replenish the, the physical aspects of your being. 
replenish it by the life of Christ that is now in you. And then also, when you've done that, when you, the Bible calls that completing your own obedience. When you've done that, then you can also affect your surrounding. So that, the, that earth is two. It first begins with you, and then it's your surrounding. So God has sent us here. We are on earth. <laughs> we are on earth. Yeah. But we need to be connected to the, to the rock from which we were healed. We need to be co connected to where we are coming from. And this connection, what will give you this connection? The Holy Spirit. Jesus said he would take of me and teach it to you. So when you learn more, with this Holy Spirit has been given unto you, you will, continue, you will begin to come into greater dimensions of the power of Christ. It's so powerful. Because the premise, the question is saying, if we are physical, we can see physical things. If we are spiritual, why can't we see spiritual things? But that is wrong. Because we can't see spiritual things. Yeah? But I am spirit and I can't see. So that is now, why now you are what? Learning where you are coming from. Okay. Because when you learn that, um, you would begin to experience that now, when we talk about seeing spiritual things, what does it mean? Does it mean seeing spirits only? No. When you talk about sight in the spirit, sight is not, sight in the spirit is, relation, is related to vision, vision, and it is also related to understanding, what you call illumination. Let us read, let me show you that via a scripture. Read 2 Corinthians, yeah, verse 3 and 4. Chapter 1. So, chapter 4, sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, mm -hmm. whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, and as the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. On them. So have you seen, it says, whose minds the God of this world has what? Blinded. Why would he use blinded? Blinded has to do with sight, right? Why is he using blinded? For mind, for something that has to do with understanding. So when we come to the realm of the spirit, sight is two things. Sight is vision. But sight is understanding. So you would say, you would say that you are spirit and you cannot see in the spirit. But you will find out that you are not correct because you see in the spirit and you have been seen in the spirit. For you to know the things that you know, when you talk about scripture, that is sight. Your friends, there's a reason why your friends out there cannot even appreciate, cannot see the things that you are seeing. That we are here today talking about Christ and looking at his word. And we understand it. That is sight. So when Jesus was opening the, the eyes of the blind, when he came our healing, that was a figure of opening our eyes, our blind eyes, to see him, to believe on him and to understand, to, to believe on him and to receive him. That is sight. That is sight. Even when we are even speaking, even in physical Sometimes we relate sight to our physical understanding. That is why we have the phrase, I see. I see. When, when we use the word, I see. I don't know if, if you're familiar with that phrase. When you say, I see, does it mean, do you always refer to what, something you see? No. You are referring to something you, un oh, you find, oh, I get it. I finally understand. I see. So sight has to do with understanding. So I tell you, on the contrary, sir, you see in the spirit. Now, if you're talking about visions, that is, there's also a place for that. And that's also, that one, in fact, the basic sight in the spirit, the basic sight actually in the spirit is understanding. That is basic giving for all. Now, when you talk about seeing visions, you are talking about graces that the Holy Spirit can give to you. If the Lord wants to show you a, a vision, you, you can't just on your own, okay, I want to switch into the spirit and see some spirits. And you switch, and then you want to see some, check out some spirits, see what's happening here. 
and you bubble back to this other dimension and you see in the physical. Well, <laughs> I know we would, we would like, if many of us had that, we are going to misuse it seriously. That's why God limits some things because we are still coming to that nature of Christ. Because if he gives us something, we will misuse it very seriously. So, they are still coming. So people can use that now for many things. You will go and do a business that God did not send you to do. And you will prosper in that business. Why? Because God knows you will disobey God to go get into a business that he did not send you to do. But when you, even after you disobey him, you will bubble out in, into the spirit, see everything that is, in the, in the, that is happening behind the scenes, get the cheat code, come back, do it, and be successful. So you will eat or you will stretch out your hand to the tree of life even after sinning against him. For that reason, he cast them out of the garden. So look, in Christ Jesus, he has put the hardest cake for us first, which is nature. Which is nature, or we can call character. It's the toughest. If it's power, <laughs> power is the simplest. We, we, have, we have looked at power so big. This is the simplest thing. But they say in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, he has put this as the front burner right now. Not that he's not giving men access into power. There's access. And we see ourselves time to time healing the sick, raising the dead, vision, and he's there. But anyone who is sensitive with the currency of the time will know that the access to this is more limited. This is what is Jesus is like. This is this is the this is it first. When you hold this and you come into this, this is more than in fact 90% of the of the job complete. 90% of it already complete. This one is just you know um, more of yeah. In fact, this one actually, funny enough, in many ways, this one. It's not actually for our personal salvation. This is for the surrounding, for the earth to benefit. This one is what will save you. So if he puts this one first, many people will have this and be going to hell. And Jesus gave a glimpse of it. How can somebody raise the dead in his name? Heal the sick in his name and he tells them, depart from me. I do not know you. Many people will just be, uh, and it's happening right now. Many people who have this have forgotten about this. Not that it is a rule. You must have, no. There are cases that it's fine. If you pursue something so much in Christ, the Lord can give you access to this. But let this not deceive you that you are actually in this. Because you can finish this and be thrown into hell. You can see all the visions. That was why Paul, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Verse 1, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I am become a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, this is the power, so that I could remove mountains and I don't have love, I am what? Nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be born and have not charity, it profited me nothing. So love is the very nature of God. And it dwells in the realm of holiness. Mm. Dwells in the realm of holiness. It's operated, powered by holiness. Holiness is where love can be found. And we walk together with faith. Love is the nature of God. God is love. God is love. So that is, has to do with character. And brother, this is what the Holy Spirit is going to work this in us. We are so privileged. When you have his spirit, as you have his spirit in you, when you pray in the spirit, many times you are building this up. You are building this up. Spirit, I need you. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in your strength.